So Allison, I'm here with Allison Peltier today. I'm excited about this um, interview and talk. You and I have become friends over yeah. the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. You're the executive director. I mean, sorry, the um, clinical director. Clinical director of South yeah. Coast Counseling, and you also have your private practice that's doing very well. Mm -hmm. I want to know a little bit more about that. But the purpose of these talks and these interviews on South Coast Counseling is to just learn about people's stories. Yeah. Um, you're a great advocate for people um, that have mental health and addiction and have mm -hmm. done a lot to help people that I've been around. And yeah. so just knowing your story, I know a little bit about mm -hmm. it, but I'm excited to learn more about you. So thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. Awesome. Yeah. So let's just start at the beginning. Where'd you grow up? Where were you born? Yeah, so I um, was born in Orange County. We actually lived in Costa Mesa the first year. Um, Oak Hospital? Um, no, I was born in like Laguna Hills. Oh, Laguna Hills. Okay. Uh huh. Yeah, and then my parents lived in an apartment right around here somewhere, um, and then they moved to Tustin. Um, so I grew up in Tustin. Um, okay. Yeah, and um, let's see, I was very athletic growing up, so they immediately put me in gymnastics. Nice. How old were you when you went in gymnastics? Uh, third grade. Okay. Um, yeah, because I was climbing the trees. I fell 10 feet out of a tree. There you go. Growing up, yeah. Um, yeah. Fun stuff. Um, and so I did gymnastics for eight years of my life. Nice. Um, was in the gym every day. Yeah. Um, missed family dinners every night. You know, it was like I did independent study in high school. I, you know, that was my life. Just focused on athletics. Yep. So what were your parents like? You were, you were born in like what kind of family? Like yeah. what did your parents do? Uh, my mom was a dental assistant, um, worked on Balboa Island for 13 years. Okay. Um, and then my dad is a college professor. He oh, also wow. has his master's in clinical psychology. Okay. Yeah. Um, but he's a career counselor. So okay. he um, helps students like figure out what path they're going to go on right. and then he teaches classes at cypress college oh that's cool yeah. so community college yep people love those jobs mm -hmm. I'm yeah he's very familiar there. yeah that's awesome mm -hmm. okay so you grew up mom's a dental assistant dad's an educator mm -hmm. what kind of household did you grow up in uh, me and my sister 13 months apart so um almost irish twins so we grew up together doing everything she's always been taller than me which is always really funny because right. um, I'm the oldest. Um, but yeah, grew up in Tustin, had a yard, had animals, you know, um, pretty like normal household, um, really Christian, um, was dedicated in a church over here okay. growing up. It used to be called Newport Vineyard. Okay. Um, so grew up pretty religious, um, really kind of, I don't know if it was my parents or the church that really scared me into like being afraid of the world right. <laughs> and afraid of like sinning and like getting in trouble. So um, growing up in high school, I didn't have boyfriends. When I did have a boyfriend, I told him like, you can't kiss me. Like I was terrified. Okay. So growing up in a church and I, I'm, I'm really familiar mm -hmm. um, we well, growing up a church and we grew up as a very religious family. And then, yeah. you know, I've been very involved with Calvary Chapel mm -hmm. throughout the years. And so, yeah. so tell me a lot about what that was like. Like you, you, yeah. so your parents are taking you to church you're mm -hmm. going every Sunday. Yep. I assume every Wednesday night also. So right? where you guys yeah. the family it went Sunday night also. Like, yeah. So. so where it all switches for me is when, um, I'm like a sophomore in high school and I'm starting to get kind of burnt out of gymnastics. I'm going every day for like five hours a day. Mm -hmm. Right. I wanted to go to UCLA and do it in college. And somewhere I got a belief maybe that I couldn't do it in college and I was wasting all my parents' money. Um, I started wanting to go to youth group on Wednesday and I couldn't because I was in the gym. Right. So um, I started asking to leave gymnastics early to go to that, started going, started making friends that were outside of the gym. So um, that was really neat for me. And mm. then. At one point, someone or a pastor talked about like a Matthew verse where you have to give up your life to get it. Mm -hmm. And somewhere in my head, that meant to give up gymnastics. Okay. So I decided to give up gymnastics, um, which <laughs> I look back now and I'm like, what a horrible decision. Right. <laughs> um, because this is what will set my life into my trauma. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so. 
So you love gymnastics from a yeah. very early age. You're, yeah. It wasn't like your parents were living through you vicariously. You Mm-mm. just loved gymnastics. It was me. Yeah. And so you got into gymnastics. You're doing that every mm-hmm. night. You're in the gym every night, going yeah. to competitions. Yep. And then sophomore year of high school. Yeah. I started, I had a really good friend. I only had one friend at Tustin High. Um, and she was really Christian too. So it kind of was feeding into all my beliefs. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so I quit gymnastics and I kind of just go full force into the church, mm-hmm. you know, like I'm losing my one identity, so I'm picking up a new one. Right. Um, I start, I become the president of FCA, which right. is Fellowship for Christian Athletes um, at Tustin High, ran that, um, started working in the church, you know, um, and so was athletics done at that point? I did track. Year? I did okay. everything at, at, in high school, but okay. I just picked things up and did them. You just had you fun, know? ran mm-hmm. track and yeah. enjoyed it. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I'm, I'm doing well. I have friends in the youth group. Like it's, it's good. So one of the, the youth pastor is one of my friend's dads, right? So totally cool. Awesome. Spent a lot of time at their house. So the church decides to get rid of this youth pastor um, and bring in some new hip person, right? Right, um, and from the moment he came in, I felt like something was wrong, right? Um, and I, it, what ended up happening was all those people that were my friends ended up going to different churches because they removed, you know, this other pastor, right? So we stayed and. Over the next three years, I was probably 16. He kind of tried to mentor me or bring me under his wing. and This new pastor. Mm-hmm, yeah. And really did. He was the one that came in and like, you know how everyone's like, oh, side hugs. Do side hugs mm-hmm. in church. He was like, like big hugs. He was like yeah. breaking barriers and like, you know, doing things that weren't appropriate. Yeah. But everybody thought it was okay. Because he's a pastor. Because he's a pastor. Mm-hmm. and. You know, he had come from Calvary, and so he had come from that really rigid belief of, mm-hmm. like, you know, really strict. And so he was doing something new, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, the next three years kind of go on, and he's in my life and uh, mentoring me, like, getting really close to all the girls, you know, a relationship where he says, I love you, I tell him back, like, and all of this is socially appropriate. Mm-hmm. Um, and then... At some point, they I become the junior high pastor okay. at the church. I'm like 19, you know, or this is maybe too far. So at some point, he's mentoring me to be to become a pastor, mm-hmm. right? And things are just inappropriate, right? Right? Did you feel that it was inappropriate, or did you? It it took it, so it, when I look back, what happened was it was a very slow grooming process. Mm-hmm. He was very slowly brainwashing me yeah. into a relationship with yeah. him. Um, he was 48. Oh, wow. He, had, he knew me at 16. Yeah. Had the next three years until I became an adult. Wow. Um, and so, you know, I wasn't doing well with my family. Mm-hmm. I don't know how much he had to do with that and isolating me. Um, he was, he had a Harley that he would take me on all the time. And like, I'm going now, like who wasn't right. like, what the fuck's going on? Yeah. What 48 year old takes a right. 18 year old on the back of their Harley yeah. and takes him to lunch all the time. Yeah. So very strange that the church and anybody didn't say anything. And that's okay. You know, it was okay. That's, that's terrible. And, and a lot of people in the church just trust people automatically because Mm -hmm. they have the label of pastor. Yeah. 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 So, um, I don't know when the first weird thing happened. I think he had pulled me onto his chest and he, I had my head on his chest and I think that was the first time I felt like something was wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, and something inside of me was like, uh Oh, like Mm -hmm. this isn't good. Yeah. And um, my sister was in Australia at this time. And so I, I was trying to call her over like Skype or whatever we had back then. And the connection was bad. And I was trying to tell her. Right. And I didn't get to tell her because yeah. the connection was going out. And the next day he came and approached me and basically he got me to lie. Mm-hmm. That was the first lie. Um, yeah. And 
I, after he was like, it was, he's like, it's fine. I know you felt something weird. We have like a David and Saul kinship. You know, it was just scripture after scripture about yeah. how it was okay. Twist in scriptures to make mm-hmm. it okay. Absolutely. Yeah. And so that was the first lie. And after I hid that, everything else, I, it was like I couldn't come forward about. Mm-hmm. Um, there was, I think the next time after he, and he used to like watch me too in the church. Like yeah. it was a very charismatic church. So they would have, everyone would go up and dance. And so sure. I'd be up there dancing and he would, he would text me and say like, I saw you dancing and like, you know, yeah, put, and, put things out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he would say stuff like, um, I wonder what Allie would be like if she, you know, fully let loose. And it was all mm-hmm. these like sexual connotations, right? Yeah. Like implanting things in my head so that when the time came, like what what yeah. would I do? Yeah. You know. Um so then after one of those rock concerts or whatever, he I I tell him like my parents aren't home. Because at this point I don't I don't even know what I'm thinking. I just tell him whatever he wants to know. Sure. He's my boss. Yeah. He's my mentor. I think he's like a father figure, but I'm really confused. Yeah. Um, never had a boyfriend, never had sex, never really had kissed anyone. Yeah. I have no idea what's going on, you yeah. know? So he comes over there and, you know, next thing I know it, he's like taking off all my clothes and, you know, he's doing stuff to me. Yeah. And um, then from then on, it was like, he did that whenever he wanted. Yeah. You know, and, um, and I just, I don't even know what happened. May, I'm, that might have gone on for like three months. Yeah. Like, it's really hard to remember those times because it, it I don't feel like I was there. Mm-hmm. You know, like yeah. I see it from up here watching my, that happen to me and me being like, I don't want this, but it's happening. Yeah. You don't want it. It's happening. It's somebody you've trusted and developed a relationship with it. Not only in situations like that, yeah. you trust someone because they're representing yeah. not only a church, but mm-hmm. who you believe God is and yeah. your so faith it, and your religion. And yeah. yeah. And at some point I think I, I decided I was in love with him. Mm-hmm. You know, now I'm totally brainwashed into this relationship. Right. Um, and he's married, by the way, and they have foster kids. And, oh, okay. You know, yeah. like it, it's a whole blown secret. Yeah. You know, that's happening. You know, he's having me sneak over to his house when he's in his RV, you know, and it, it's just crazy. I think I, at this point, I actually moved out of my parents' house to move in with another family um, from the church, I think to get away from him mm-hmm. because he was in Tustin too. And I remember he would ride his Harley out to Huntington to, to, and be like, I'm out here mm-hmm. and I would have to go meet him. Yeah. You know? And I, it was just, and are you the, uh, you, and at this time you're the junior high mm-hmm. youth pastor at this church. Mm-hmm. Also. And he's the high school pastor. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the, the head pastor of that church and his wife, I grew up with their daughter. Um, she at one point asks me like is something going on and I no, I say, no, of course not. Mm-hmm. Like I lie. Um, I wish I would have told her then, Yeah, you know, um, and then, you know, it's, it's ongoing. I don't know what's happening. And, and then finally, like, I think he's, he hasn't had sex with me yet. Mm-hmm. You know, he's just kind of molesting me and, right. you know, um, and so at some point he does. And I just remember I was totally dissociated, I was totally dissociated like in pain i remember being just like moved around like an object and feeling so like this is horrible i, I tried to leave after that and like it was in that but then i think it happened again like very blurry um and then i get sick and um i tell him so he takes me to the er or to hogue or something and i have an std oh wow mm-hmm. And um, I think at that point he knows I can't keep the secret, mm-hmm. you know, that I'm going to tell someone now because right. like, I'm obviously not okay. Yeah. Um, so he goes and tells the church himself 
Mm, got ahead of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so um, they tell me you're not welcome back. Um, wow. They just dropped you. Dropped me. Um, they tell him he's not welcome back either. Mm-hmm. But they send an email out to everybody saying, like, inappropriate relationship. And they write it off as, like, I'm a scarlet A. I'm yeah. A scarlet letter. And yeah. um, it was just an affair. And so I'm left with like no support. My parents didn't even understand yeah. what had happened um, because back then we didn't have the Me Too movement. Right. So yeah. a lot of people thought that I was having an affair with this man. Right. <laughs> instead of like. Who's him. married and twice your age. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Who met you when you were 16. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then I'm just kind of left to pick up the pieces of my life and. You know. And that church right now is your whole world. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I was going to, like, not go to school anymore. I was going to, like, he uh, was telling me he was going to divorce his wife and he was going to take me with, like, you know, there was all these crazy things going on. Um, But it ends and and the wife finds out she forgives him. They move to Massachusetts and he runs away and goes and be a pastor somewhere else. Yeah. So um, then I'm left with all the pieces. Right. 19. You're 19 years old. 19. I went and bought a Harley. Oh, wow. Yeah. Went and got my motorcycle license because that's what he did. Yeah. You know? Um, crashed it once. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah. So then I go to Vanguard. That was, It was like in the summer between community college and when I was supposed okay, to Okay, so you're going to what, OCC or Golden West? I was going or? to Santiago. Santiago, mm-hmm. and then you transferred to Vanguard. Yep. So you transferred to a Christian school even though you had gone through mm-hmm. all that. Yeah. So. Was, yeah, it was just all in the middle. Yeah. You know, it was probably like in that summer that it was all happening. So I go to Vanguard and I think everyone's like, okay, she's there, like, it's fine, right? Right. Um, things obviously were not okay. You know, um, they, my parents helped put me in therapy. Um, I got on medication, like, cause I was depressed. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, made friends, things seemed to be going okay. Um, but I was like severely depressed, even though I was functioning and I was going to school and I was still going to work. Like I was self harming. I was going into work and and my boss was asking, like, what's all over your arm? And I told her, oh, my guitar scratched it. Yeah. There were cuts all over my arm. Yeah. Um, so I just I didn't know how to cope with yeah. any of it. Um, and then there was one night that all the roommates were going to go to, like, I don't know, a bar or something or mm-hmm. a club. And they're all 21. I'm 20. So I don't get to go. I just, like, pregame with them or whatever. And, yeah. and they leave. And I'm, you know decided I'm going to try and kill myself. This like, is at 20, is you're at 20, mm-hmm. 20 now. Yeah. Okay. I'm like, this is too painful. Yeah. Like I can't come back from any of this. No one's going to want me like it. And I just don't want to live. And I still had all the, these memories of him and they were just flooding. I wasn't sleeping. Mm-hmm. Um, I was having just flashbacks. I was dissociating in the middle of the day. Like, you know, so I took all the medication I had and drank the rest of the alcohol that was there. I think I called my sister, and then I think I called him over and over again. And I don't know what I said, yeah. but I was trying to ask him why he did this to me. Mm-hmm. And um, I woke up the next morning with my parents standing over me because um, I think my sister had called them, and they were going, did you do this because of him? And I said, yes. <laughs> And then all my roommates promised that they were going to watch me that day. So my parents left and I went about my day again. So you woke up and you stayed in the same place. Like you didn't go anywhere. Nobody called. You just survived your Mm -hmm. attempt. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Went to work the next day, tried to drink a bunch of bleach (laughs) because I wasn't, I wasn't done trying. Yeah. Um, and I just didn't know how to do it. I didn't have like the tools to, to kill myself. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was like trying to figure it out, you know? Um, but they told my therapist. So then my therapist is calling me every day to do like suicide checks with me and, you know, and, and that helped, you know, I think that that helped. Um, 
wasn't until maybe my sister came and talked to me and was like, you can't die. Like, you can't. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? And I was like, I don't care. Like, I literally looked her in the eyes and said, I don't care. I'm going to kill myself. Yeah. And she was sobbing. Like, what are you talking about? Yeah. You can't. And, you know, I, I think her coming and, and talking to me, like, finally I started to go like, okay, maybe I, like, I don't know. I just... I think the medication they had me on too made me worse, right. more suicidal. So when they switched my medication, I, I, I think it helped. Yeah. Um, and then I, I just I stayed in therapy and I just took forever, you know, Yeah. day after day, like, but I just slowly started to get better, you know, yeah. and want to live. Yeah. But um, I mean, it's been 10 years. 11 years maybe yeah. since it happened and like I have thoughts every day sure um, and like I've gone through EMDR I've done all this work but his voice is still in there still there yeah yeah so um, take a couple breaths thank you for being so honest and transparent about that story so, but you're at Vanguard and you're in therapy. At what point did you decide you want to be a therapist and maybe kind of use some of this to help other people? Yeah. Was so, that right away or did you mm -hmm. always think you want to be a therapist because your no. dad was or? No, I want to be a homicide detective. <laughs> <laughs> you would be good at that. So, yeah. 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 I wanted to be a cop. So my bachelor's was in like sociology with okay. a criminal justice emphasis. So okay. that's what I kind of wanted to do. Um, so, I mean, they, in one of my like practicums, they have you go interview someone. So I interviewed my therapist and I heard what she was saying. and Something like resonated with me mm -hmm. on that. Um, and I kind of was like, oh, do I want to be more jaded or mm -hmm. do I want to heal people? Right. And I chose, I want to be able to heal people. Yeah. And I knew if it weren't for me being in therapy that I would have killed myself. Right. You know, saved your life. She was the only one that finally was able to see what was going on. Mm -hmm. Everybody else thought I was having an affair. Yeah. It wasn't until she was like, Allie, he was a predator. Yeah. Like he took advantage of you. And she right. had to tell me over and over again for two years until I believed her. Yeah. <laughs> because I thought I was responsible. Yeah. 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 It's interesting. I, I went through a thing with a young man that I coached that, Calvary Chapel and he was going to a different church not Calvary Chapel but he one of the volunteer youth guys groomed mm -hmm. him and took advantage of him and I w had to go to the you know I was real close to this kid and when he had to he finally came out with it when he had mm -hmm. to testify in court against this guy I went with him and I was talking to one of the um DAs there and I was like yeah I just can't believe it he met this yeah. guy in church and you know he's like Chris, there's a lot of good people in church, but that's also where predators plant yeah. themselves. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, a really scary thing as a parent, yeah. you know, for me. And mm -hmm. I think church is, a, you know, right. a beautiful thing. I'm not against mm -hmm. church, but it's like, mm -hmm. you know, I, it, a light bulb went off above my head with that. I was like, yeah, the predators are putting themselves in positions yeah. where there are people that they are attracted mm -hmm. to. And it's yeah. a lot of times in church or youth, organizations schools. or schools yeah. and so mm -hmm. we got to be careful yeah. as parents and mm -hmm. really educate our kids and yeah. talk to them early because my parents never had those talks with right. me and like yeah. I don't think they knew to have those talks mm -hmm. with me and I don't know if yours did no. but you know no. now that we know what we know it's like yeah and I look yeah. back now and I see I wasn't the only one he was grooming right you know he he had another girl living in his house renting from him sure who was a little bit older than me yeah and I look back, I'm like, it could have been her, you know? Or maybe it was her too. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, there's usually more than one. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's a scary world we live in with that. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you survived that and mm -hmm. are doing well now. Yeah. Okay, so let's get back to you decided to become a therapist. So mm -hmm. you interviewed this therapist and you mm -hmm. made that decision. And yeah. then you finished your bachelor's in sociology mm -hmm. and criminal justice. Yep. And mm -hmm. then went straight into your master's. Yeah, I took a year off to save money. And then went back to Vanguard to do my master's. Okay. Um, uh, changed therapist. And she had me do, or I did, I did a Me Too um, story. 
and posted on Facebook and okay. got, and finally came out with it. Yeah. You know, and a lot of people from that church were like, what the fuck? Right. <laughs> you know, um, so that was more healing than I thought it would be. Right. Um, and so, yeah, stayed in, in my master's and just, you know, really started to understand what had happened to me. You mm-hmm. know, as much as my master's was to set me up, it also helped me start to heal too mm-hmm. and understand. Like, I didn't understand why there were, you know, who, like, I couldn't kept conceptualize, like, who he was or where he came from or if he was bad or good or, yeah. you know, was he a servant of God? And mm-hmm. it was just so hard to put those pieces together yeah. um, that I finally did in grad school where I was like, oh, he's just an evil person. Yeah. Like, they exist. <laughs> yeah. They do exist, Mm -hmm. and that's true. So I'd like to kind of like dig in and ask you a little bit about what that did to your faith and like what that did to your belief and Mm kind of how you got through that and worked through that and came out the other end. Yeah, so it's challenging because I grew up as like a perfect child. I didn't Mm -hmm. do anything. I didn't rebel and went to serve the Lord, you know, and I felt really betrayed, Right. you know. Um, Not only by him, but the church turn their that church you went yeah. to turn their back on you mm-hmm. yeah yeah and so um vanguard gave me a, a different um not maybe not belief system but i worked through it a different way mm-hmm. you know i don't necessarily like believe in the church mm-hmm. <laughs> you know um but i i've been able to work through it and have my own beliefs and my own thoughts about god yeah you know it's definitely not as rigid i'm more like Someone's out there, yeah. but I don't really know who he is, yeah. you know, and, and if it's Jesus and God, mm-hmm. and the church, you know, it could be, totally could be, but, you know, I don't really, it, it doesn't make perfect sense to me right. anymore, right. you know. Is that something you worked through in therapy? Is, did you have anger towards the church or did mm-hmm. you just have anger towards that specific church? Um, definitely the church in general. Yeah. Because it wasn't just you know, the church I was at that knew about it, mm-hmm. you know, they had sister churches. Yeah. My aunts and uncles went to other sister churches and they all knew about it. Yeah. You know, it was the vineyard. It right. was, you know, um, a whole thing and, and no one knew what was going on. They were just like, you need to, you know, forgive and you need to do this. And it was all these things being thrown at me that didn't make any sense. Yeah. You know, you need to forgive him. I'm like, I'm not forgiving him. Yeah. He doesn't deserve any yeah. of that. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah it, a lot of anger towards the church, you know, and just misunderstanding. You know, right. psychology finally gave me the ability to understand. Yeah. You know, the church didn't. Right. You know? Yeah. So you go to Vanguard mm-hmm. and you, you know, with your degree, right? You get, mm-hmm. After you finish your degree or while you're doing your degree, mm-hmm. you have to... Yeah, you start seeing clients. Start seeing clients in like a practicum program. Yeah. What, what was that like? How'd you st- who did you start with? Was it adolescents? Was it adults? Where was that? <laughs> started at the Salvation Army. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Scared out of my mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, because I didn't want to sit with men. Right. You know, I was terrified. Yeah. Um, with my, good reason. Yeah. yeah. And my first four clients were men. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so I worked through that, you know, and that's where, I mean, I started with addiction. And um, even in one of my classes, I went to an AA meeting mm-hmm. and I remember feeling like it was the first time I wasn't alone mm-hmm. because they kept talking about having a disease, yeah. you know, and I was like, I have this secret, you know, and I can't talk to anybody about it. Mm-hmm. But it was like they understood, yeah. you know. It was this crazy thing, yeah. and that helped too. Yeah, we have a saying in in the program uh, mm-hmm. that I love. It's like the one place where we love you because you're broken. Yeah, you know, we mm-hmm. don't love you because you're somebody's mom, brother, sister, right. aunt, mm-hmm. uncle, friend. Yeah. It's we love each other because we're broken in the right. program, and so right. it's a beautiful thing. Mm-hmm. And I'm glad you felt that when yeah. you walked in there. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you go to your first AA meeting, mm-hmm. Salvation Army, for people that don't know, it's a year-long program, right? Six months. Six months. To a year, yeah. And you got to be pretty serious about yeah. wanting to do it in order to mm-hmm. do it. So what were those guys like? Oh, yeah, they were tough. Yeah. <laughs> they were tough. Yeah. But, I mean, it's funny what therapy can do. I mean, I remember sitting with this guy for six months, and I don't think I said two words to him. 
he's he's talked the entire time but afterwards he was crying to me thanking me for the space right and in reality that's what therapy is it's holding space for someone right and so i mean i didn't do anything back then like i'm having interventions right i wasn't this great therapist yet i just listened right and he was like crying thanking me yeah. like for my work and i was like what work <laughs> right and there's such power in that like being able to, like you said you yeah you did a me too story uh -huh. and there's such power in just yeah. being able to kind of mm -hmm. open up and let things go yeah things that we think we're never going to tell somebody right. or i'm going to keep this and mm -hmm. you know yeah and so i mean it was after kind of some of those experiences that i was like oh this is where i belong right like this is what I do. Yeah. Well, I know you're really good at this. Is that when you kind of go, okay, I can do this. I'm really yeah. good at this. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Yeah. So you get from Salvation Army, then what? Mm -hmm. Where do I go? Um, I go to a group home, Crittenton, working with um, foster kids who live in a group home now. That was really brutal. But, How old were they? Um, 13, 14, 15. Okay. You know, um, and that's where I had a girl that like nobody liked. She was a difficult client. Right. Um, she had probably like um, intermittent explosive disorder. She'd break things, all this stuff. Um, but a lot of those girls were traffic trafficked. Um, right. And so. Um, so was it all girl, all females? This group? Yeah. Home? Okay. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I started working with her, and I was seeing myself in her. Mm -hmm. She was groomed, and she was fourteen, and she was pregnant by oh, this wow. by this like pimp. Mm -hmm. And um, she didn't have any idea. Yeah. She was in love with him. Yeah. And I was like, oh, my God. Like, there I am. Yeah. Um, and so I got to just, like, you know, be her therapist and be with her and help her and do what I could. But I just knew that all she needed was someone to be with her and on her side. Yeah. I wasn't going to challenge her. I wasn't going to try and pull her away. Um, I mean, we were going to report him every time he came and tried to pick her up, right? Sure. But I was going to hold space for her. Yeah. Not, she was never going to feel judged from me. Yeah. You know? And so, I mean, I just started developing, you know, my niche in that. And, like, I, I can see things that other people can't. Yeah. Because of what I've been through. Yeah. You know? Where other people are like, oh, she's stupid, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, she's a kid. Yeah, I read in the book that da 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 It's like, no. yeah, you felt it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what was that like? Was it empowering? Did it did it help? Does that kind of stuff help you heal when you go through experiences like that with a client? Or some of does it, it bring it up more? Brings or? it up. Yeah. yeah, I mean, even when you ask me to do this podcast, it's like the past two weeks, it's like all that's in my head now. Yeah, like, and I'm like, fuck, like I don't right. want to be thinking about this stuff. But yeah, um, yeah, parts of it are really healing, and parts of it bring the stuff back up. Yeah, you know. And it's just, it's always going to be painful. I've yeah. just come to accept that. Yeah. There's no like, oh, and now it's better. Like, right. you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's just some things that just don't ever completely heal mm -hmm. and probably shouldn't. Yeah. 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 So wh what, how do you deal with that? Like when you go through something like that that brings something up, what do you do for um, your self-care? I mean, I'm literally going to go to the gym right after this. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Because I'm like, I'm going to have to get it out. Um, I did a lot of EMDR. Um, what else have I done? So for people that don't know, what, mm -hmm. is, e what is EMDR? Um, EMDR, it stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. Right. It's a different form of processing because trauma doesn't get stored in your normal filing cabinet in mm -hmm. your brain. It gets stored in your body. Um, so you have to be able to have the different parts of your brain communicate. <clears throat> and it does that by bilateral stimulation or yeah. like riding a bike, walking. Those things connect all parts of your brain right. so that you can reprocess it and put it in the right filing cabinet. Got it. Um, but it, it takes a while and it's targeting, you know, really traumatic memories. Right. Because yeah. you're trying to desensitize from it yeah. so that you can view the memory and it not be as startling. Right. So, I mean, my that first memory I had of him, you know, raping me, mm -hmm. um, I couldn't, like, have sex with any of my boyfriends. Yeah. Because I was so traumatized. Anytime they, we tried, I would panic and yeah. I would run. I would literally run. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, like, I was never going to have 
never going to be able to get married. Right. Um, and, you know, had a boyfriend. It was all right. Kind of worked, kind of didn't. And then, you know, broke up with him. And, you know, it was kind of like, I don't know what's, what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. Like, so I went into EMDR to target that. And, you know, she was doing like 90 minute sessions with me because it was ingrained. It was. Yeah. And, um, you know, we did that maybe like for three months and I wasn't really sure if it was working or not. Um, and then I met Stuart mm-hmm. and um, was like, hey, FYI, like, can't touch me, can't, mm-hmm. you know, and he was like, this girl isn't into me. Like, yeah. and I was like, because I, I just didn't think it was going to work, yeah. you know, and um, when we finally t- did get to that place, I was like, oh, that wasn't as bad as it usually is, yeah. you know. And um, I was like, oh, that's crazy. Yeah. Like, it wasn't something that I was super aware of, but right. like from where I was before having panic attacks and yeah. like, you can't touch me and, you know, it's yeah. not going to work. Like, to, I can have a somewhat okay yeah. sexual relationship with someone. Yeah. And I'm like, that was EMDR. Because <laughs> EMDR helped mm-hmm. you get through that. Yeah. So Stuart, for people that don't know, is yeah. your fiance, fiance as of what, three weeks ago? Uh, was it been a month? Or? It was November. It's been a few months. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. Do you guys have a date set for the wedding? We do. August. Oh, nice. August 10th. Yeah. I love it. Mm-hmm. That's great. Yeah. So back to the group home. Okay. So you mm-hmm. leave, you've, you're, you're doing your practicum. Mm-hmm. You're in there with a group home. For people that don't know, a group home is a place where kids go that don't have yeah. any kind of family support mm-hmm. or their family support so dysfunctional. It's yeah. not safe for them to live there. Mm-hmm. And then, so how long did you do that for? Maybe like nine months. Okay. Yeah. And did you decide at that point, like, you liked adolescent, working with adolescents? Yeah. That was your jam? Yeah, I did. I liked working with adolescents. The structure of the, uh, it's like a DMH place was just really taxing and exhausting. You were on yeah. call for like two weeks straight and, gotcha. you know, never like, so it, it was like, it was a lot, mm-hmm. you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, I connected with every teen there and was like, yeah, love it. This yeah. is great, you yeah. know. Um, and then where'd you go from there? That, then I went to, I had to kind of just get out because I was exhausted. So I mm. went to, I said I wasn't going to work in rehabs again because mm. Salvation Army had scared me. Yeah. <laughs> but I ended up going to Northbound. Okay. Um, and was there in different population, right. you know, um, and started working with clients there and figured out, you know, Oh, I liked this too. I had a lot of trauma clients. Um, and so I started to hone in on my niche some more, Mm -hmm. um, and the connection with addiction and trauma. Yeah. And so I was really starting to like jive with them as well and go like, I get this too. Right. (laughs) Um, and then they changed some leadership stuff. So I ended up leaving and went to another rehab, South Coast Behavioral, um, and was working there for like a year and a half, got licensed, um, and then I went to Newport Academy. Which Newport Academy is adolescence. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And got to do family sessions, which I hadn't really done before. Um, and had seen some really cool stuff happen in family yeah. sessions. Um, you know, really helped some very suicidal teens, like, tell their parents what they were going through and have the parents step in and repair with them. Right. You know, which I had never, I didn't really have that when I was going through all my stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, And so to me, that was really, you know, empowering and and really neat to see. Yeah. And you loved working with teens. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. And then from Newport Academy, you... I moved on over to South Coast Counseling. Yeah, moved on over to us, and yep. uh, here we've been. You've yep. been here, what, three, three and a half years, something two, like Two years. <laughs> two years? <laughs> oh, okay. Like, feels like three. <laughs> nice. It does feel like three. We've been through a lot. And yeah. It's been a lot of people mm-hmm. come through. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I have some questions for you that are just kind of off yeah. the wall. Tell me about your favorite experience as a therapist with a, with a client. Oh. I don't, I mean idea i mean it's probably that family session comes to mind of like connecting the parents to the kid again because it was every week that i was doing it and like you know helping the family communicate um to the kid and say like i love you right you know it was super challenging it was out of my comfort zone but you know i i still see that client and they tell me like you know that changed things. Yeah. I didn't think my parents wanted me. Right. You know, 
So, I mean, that was really neat. Um, I don't know about like with adolescence and all of us, it's like, Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm grown, but like there's still stuff from my childhood that the Mm -hmm. way my parents raised me that wasn't so great Yeah, and not the kind of parent I Mm want to be. Right. And I'm sure they were raised the same way. And then, you know, the, the chain of events Mm -hmm. happens and, and, um, yeah, the family stuff is, is so Mm -hmm. important. And for people that are listening, if you have a loved one that's involved in addiction, the people that's families get involved in their recovery have a way better chance. Mm -hmm. So, so, um, tell me about like just one really rough client that you had where it's like, Mm. (laughs) I don't know what I can say. You can say Uh, whatever you want as long as you don't, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Bring up names. Yeah, I mean, one of the, the first one of the first clients I had at Salvation Army mm-hmm. traumatized me pretty badly. Um, yeah, he was pretty narcissistic mm-hmm. and um, was always trying to push boundaries and flirt with me and yeah. ask me if I had a boyfriend and you know felt that was the first time I started to feel that sick feeling again. Yeah, and I and I was. The supervisor was on leave and so they kept me with him and what they should have done was transfer him to someone Mm -hmm. else you know because i was like not okay you know so that was really difficult and that's what made me not want to keep working in rehabs was because of that experience yeah being afraid of that Mm -hmm. and bringing all that stuff back up right and feeling unsafe in the room yeah you know yeah yeah what do you think about south coast counseling as far as like why it's so special and i mean i feel like we're Mm-hmm. There's a lot of great treatment centers yeah. out there. You mentioned one northbound and mm-hmm. you know, Newport Academy. But yeah. what, what do you feel like special about South Coast Counseling? Yeah, I mean, South Coast Counseling it has that magic in the house. Mm-hmm. You know, you walk in there and it's there is that warm feeling. Yeah. That's just, you know, you can't get rid of it. Yeah. Um, when you run groups in there, it's warm, yeah. you know, and people have a sense of safety there right and i mean you heard my story yeah. safety is what it's about that's absolutely you know you know how i make my curriculum and yeah. it's all about safety mm-hmm. um and people really can go there to share their stories and heal right. you right. know yeah. that's i love it and and that's a common theme when i ask mm-hmm. people that question is there's yeah. magic in that house there's yeah. something about that place mm-hmm. that's and I think because it's been there so long, yeah. so many people's lives mm-hmm. have been saved through that mm-hmm. place. It's just neat. Yeah. So, so a couple of kind of tough questions. What would you tell, um, you know, knowing your experience and what you went through, what mm-hmm. would you tell parents to like talk to their kids about? And, and how, yeah. how would you approach that? Like as a parent, when you, you mm-hmm. and Stuart eventually have kids, like, yeah. like what's your, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, it's don't trust people. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, you don't have to trust your teachers. Yeah. You, it's earned. Mm-hmm. You know, if something doesn't feel right, like tell someone immediately. Yeah. You know, and don't be afraid to to talk about it. Yeah. You know, um, because I think we were told like, you know, tr- respect your elders, respect mm-hmm. your teachers. Like they're right. Don't talk back. You know. And that got ingrained in us to not trust our alarm systems. Yeah. So when stuff did go wrong, like I didn't know what to do. Yeah. You know, I was told to not say anything. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, you don't have to trust yeah. everyone. And if your parents had ingrained that, I mean, you don't want to blame your parents because they mm-hmm. were just doing the best they yeah. can. But like, yeah. you know, I want my daughter to know, hey, if something yeah. doesn't feel right, you need to come talk to us. Mm-hmm. It's okay. Yeah. You know, you don't yeah. have to trust somebody because they have the label mm-hmm. of a teacher or a pastor or yeah. a, principle or whatever that is Mm -hmm. you know yeah so it's super scary but it's like something that you Mm -hmm. know and i think also as parents like you put off having those talks are they old enough yet are they can they understand and Mm -hmm. i think the earlier the better yeah yeah Mm -hmm. yeah my daughter is so outgoing and wants to talk to everybody it's so (laughs) scary you know it's like she just walk up to anybody Mm -hmm. hey you -hmm. You know and so Mm -hmm. you got to keep an eye on her um what would you tell somebody that has has just gone through something like you've gone through um that's created a lot of trauma in their life and it's feeling how you felt that moment that you wanted to take your own life Mm -hmm. Um, what what would your message be to that person um it would be you know there's a lot of people who understand you know what you've gone through 
Um, and most trauma survivors don't talk about it, you know, yeah. but find a therapist <laughs> that knows, right. you know, find somebody that knows. Yeah. Because that's the only way you're going to be yeah. okay. Yeah. You know, I know a lot of guys that have tried to find therapists and they go talk to one. I didn't just really didn't like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so what would you tell people about finding a therapist? Cause that can be tricky as well. I mean, it's the same thing. Like you don't have to trust anyone. Like mm -hmm. I tell people that when they're finding a therapist, I'm like you don't have to trust the therapist. Yeah. Don't trust me. You're vetting me out too. Right. You know, that's okay. I yeah. literally will tell my trauma clients that you don't have to trust me yet. Yeah. You don't have to trust me at all. Yeah. Like, because now I'm giving you the, the safe space yeah. you need. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, call other therapists, ask them hard questions, right. you know, and until you feel safe. Is it appropriate to do a 15 minute, 10 minute yep. interview with a therapist yep. before you decide mm -hmm. that they're your therapist? Yep. I do a 15 minute free consultation. Yeah. You know, and if a therapist doesn't want to do that, they're probably mm -hmm. not. Yeah. Not yeah, free. It's yeah. easy. Yeah. 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 Most therapists do that. Yeah. So tell me about your private practice. I want to know about that because that's that's a pretty neat yeah. part of your career. I kind of see that uh -huh. happening on the outskirts a little bit, but not too involved yeah. with that. So yeah. So I mean, um, I see some adolescents. You know, um, I see some young adults. Um, you know, uh, all the things that we've already talked about is like my niche and who I see. But you know, a lot of trauma, a lot of like you know, me too stories, mm -hmm. you know, um, that they, they read my psychology today and I kind of describe trauma and some of these aspects without self-disclosing my whole story and right. they read it and they go like, Oh, maybe that's who I need to go talk to, mm -hmm. you know? Um, cause it says me too at the bottom of my page, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, just mainly primarily women, at right. this point, you know, yeah. and, and creating that safe place to, to work through some of the things I do EMDR as well when clients are ready. Got um, it. but I really feel like people have to be able to, to kind of tell their story to someone yeah. before we do EMDR, yeah. you know? Yeah. So a little plug for your private practice. Mm -hmm. If anybody needs a free consultation, yeah. <laughs> feel free to reach out to uh -huh. Allison. We're going to put this on my Instagram, which is going to be linked mm -hmm. to your Instagram. People yeah. can DM you on there. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. okay. Yeah. yeah. And then there's, you know, yeah. phone numbers and ways to get in touch mm -hmm. with you on that. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, let's wrap this up. Is there anything else you'd like to share in closing or? Mm -hmm. No, I don't it's think so. It's been awesome. It's been such a <laughs> such an eye-opening conversation with you yeah. and I, I I didn't know all that stuff yeah. about your story and mm -hmm. I really want to thank you for coming and being so transparent, open, honest. Yeah. And um I think that this story can mm -hmm. help a lot of people. Yeah. And that's kind of neat that you're willing to put that out there. Yeah. Because I think not being alone Right. And knowing that somebody went mm -hmm. through something that you've gone through kind yeah. of will allow people to kind of mm -hmm. open up. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Yeah. Good deal. <laughs>